أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ثم أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إني وجهت وجهي للذي فطر السماوات والأرض حنيفا وما أنا من المشركين Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 79 continues the conversation that Ibrahim alayhi salam has with the people of Babylon who were worshipping the celestial bodies they were worshipping the sun the moon and the stars and even the idols so in this ayah Ibrahim says indeed I have turned my face towards he who originated the heavens and the earth inclining towards truth and I am not of the polytheists Ibrahim alayhi salam says inni wajjah tu that I turn my face to the one who has originated the heavens and the earth. Now what does it mean when he says that I turn my face towards God? The Mufassirin of the Holy Quran, they say that to turn one's face towards God means to orient one's, one's entire being towards the worship and obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It means to turn to Him wholeheartedly through action, through your words, that you direct your mind, your heart, every atom of your being to Him. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is identified not as the creator of the heavens and the earth, but as the originator of the heavens and the earth. And the verb, Fatara is used as opposed to khalaqa. Now in the Arabic language, the word fatara comes from the word futur. The word futur is probably familiar to many of you. In the month of Ramadan, when you break your fast, we call it the time of iftar. So the word fatara literally means to break something, to split it. If you go to Surah Al-Anbiya, Surah 21 verse 30, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the creation of the heavens and the earth, of the universe. He says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَنَّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ كَانَتَا رَتْقًا فَفَتَقْنَاهُمَا Do the disbelievers not see that the heavens and the earth, the, the universe was a single mass, and we split it. Now we know, according to modern science, we're familiar with the Big Bang Theory. You know, there was a time, perhaps around 15 to 20 billion years ago, where everything in the universe was concentrated into one mass. And because the energy built up and built up, there was a Big Bang that took place. Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he speaks about how he's turning himself, his face to Allah, he uses the word fatara, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought the heavens and the earth into being by a process of splitting. And the word fatara here is used. Inni wajjahtu wajhiya lilladhi fatara samawati wal ard. So to turn your face towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means that you orient your entire being towards Him. You worship Him, you obey Him, 
everything, all of your efforts are directed towards his pleasure and his satisfaction. And then Allah subhanahu wa then Ibrahim alayhi salam mentions the word Hanif. إِنِّي وَجَّهْتُ وَجْهِيَ لِلَّذِي فَطَرَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ حَنِيفًا وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ Now what does the word Hanif mean? In the Holy Quran, the word Hanif is predominantly used in connection to Ibrahim alayhi salam. In some verses they are used in reference to the Holy Prophet. The word Hanif comes from the verb Hanifa, which means to incline. The Mufassirin of the Qur'an, they say, Ibrahim inclined away from polytheism, even though he was surrounded by it, even though he had family members, his own uncle was an idol maker. So Hanifa means to incline. Ibrahim alayhi salam, According to the Mufassirin, they say he inclined away from polytheism towards monotheism. Hadith refers to pure monotheism, a type of tawheed that is devoid of all forms of shirk. You know, brothers and sisters, we have theoretical Tawheed and we have practical Tawheed. Ibrahim alayhi salam when he says that he is a Hanif and he's not among the Mushrikeen, he's negating both theor theoretical polytheism and practical polytheism. Theoretical shirk and practical shirk. Now you and I we are monotheistic in theory, but in practice, many of us are mushrikeen in practice. Now, what do I mean by this? This is alluded to in Surah Al Ankabut, Surah number 29, verse 65. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a scenario where human beings instinctively turn to Him in times of danger. فَإِذَا رَكِبُ So ayah number 65 from Surah Al-Ankabut. Surah 29 verse 65. فَإِذَا رَكِبُوا فِي الْفُلْكِ When you're on a ship, and here, ship is used in, as an example of a mode of transportation. فَإِذَا رَكِبُوا فِي الْفُلْكِ دَعَوُ اللَّهَ مُخْرِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينِ When you're traveling and you encounter danger, there is a, a perilous circumstance that has taken place. When people fear for their lives, when there is danger, when there is extreme hardship, people naturally incline towards God. They reach out to Him. And Allah mentions this, that when you're in the ship and you encounter difficulties and hardship, you turn to me, invoking me with sincerity. You supplicate to me with sincerity. فَلَمَّا نَجَّاهُمْ إِلَى الْبَرِ Allah says, when I rescue you, when I take you out of danger, what happens? Do we thank Allah? Do we recognize Him as the one who has rescued us from those moments of terror? Allah says, فَلَمَّا نَجَّاهُمْ إِلَى الْبَرِ إِذَا هُمْ يُشْرِكُونَ Allah says, when they are rescued, when they are taken to safety, they associate partners with me. Now this doesn't mean that they, they believe that there are other gods, but they attribute their rescue, they attribute the assistance they receive to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, if you go to Surah Yusuf, verse 106, Allah says, وَمَا يُؤْمِنُ Allah says, and the majority of them, the majority of the people who believe in Allah, theoretically they're monotheist. They're monotheistic. But Allah says, the majority of those who believe in Allah ascribe partners to Him. Where do they ascribe partners to Him? Where is the shirk? 
It's not in theory, it's in their practice. They, in their eyes, their sustenance comes from human beings. Their safety, their sense of security and stability comes from the created, not the creator. So their shirk is on the practical level. So Ibrahim السلام, when he says, Inni wajjahtu wajhiya lilladhi fatara samawati wal ard hanifan wa ma ana min al mushrikeen. He's speaking about the pure tawheed that all of us need to aspire to. It's not just the belief, the idea that God is one. It's that you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the source of all goodness in your life. That you see Him as the one who rescues you from your times of difficulty. That He's the one who lifts you up during your times of sorrow and grief. In ayah number 80, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says of Surah Al-An'am, وَحَاجَّهُ قَوْمُ قَالَ أَتُحَاجُّونِّ فِي اللَّهِ وَقَدْ هَدَانِي وَلَا أَخَافُ مَا تُشْرِكُونَ بِهِ إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ رَبِّي شَيْئًا وَسِعَ رَبِّي كُلَّ شَيْءٍ عِلْمًا أَفَلَا تَتَذَكَّرُونَ Allah says, and his people, and the people of Ibrahim, and his people argued with him, they disputed with him. He said to them, do you argue with me concerning God while he has guided me? And I fear not what you associate with him unless my Lord should will something. My Lord encompasses all things in knowledge. Then will you not remember? Ibrahim السلام, his community disputed with him. They argued with him. And the arguments they put forward as to why they were not willing to submit to one God was the following. Number one, they were professing that they were merely following the tradition of their forefathers. So they framed their argument against Ibrahim that, are you trying to obliterate our heritage? Idol worship. Polytheism is our culture. This is something that we have inherited from our forefathers. This is a part of Babylonian heritage. So they frame their argument as an attack on their culture and their heritage. So they invoke culture and heritage. Number two, they dispute with him by expressing surprise that Ibrahim السلام, would limit worship to a single God. Now this is not explicitly mentioned in Surah Al-An'am, but if you go for example to Surah number 38, ayah number 5, the community of Ibrahim, when he was calling them, when he was inviting them towards monotheism, they said to him, أَجَعَلَ الْآلِهَةَ إِلَاهًا وَاحِدًا إِنْ هَذَا لَشَيْءٌ عُجَابٌ They would say, is Ibrahim reducing our deities, our gods to one God? Is he saying that there's only one God? إِنْ هَذَا لَشَيْءٌ عُجَابٌ They say this is something that's amazing, it's astonishing. Look at how shirk became part and parcel of their psyche of their society of their value system they said how could he reduce the gods to a single god now i'm sure that there is an also an economic dimension to their frustration and their uh, their argumentation their dispute because if ibrahim's uncle is an idol maker his business depends on polytheism if Ibrahim says there's one God, Ibrahim's uncle goes out of business. And the same, this was the same problem during the time of the Prophet. There were approximately 360 idols being housed inside of the Kaaba. And each tribe had its own idol, and many of these tribes would flock to Mecca to perform religious rituals. 
So it, it, it created an economic problem for them, as we mentioned probably in our early sessions, that Tawheed was not only a, a theological dilemma, it was an economic crisis for them. So they say, Thirdly, the people of Ibrahim, they disputed with him and they argued with him by threatening that their false deity, deities and idols would bring harm upon him if, if he continued in his rejection. Now, Ibrahim alayhi salam, as you can imagine, he probably was wondering how his people could even think that their vain disputations would have an effect on him. He says that I am Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided me. That when you when you're guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have a type of resilience and resolve that's unprecedented. Now keep in mind that Ibrahim is a youth. He's a young man, probably a teenager. And he's up against his entire community. All of the elders, the religious clergy of that society, his own family members, his own uncle, who is the chief advisor to the king, who himself claimed to be a god. So the entire society is against Ibrahim a.s. But when he speaks out against their, their gods, he does it with full confidence. They try to intimidate him. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that a mu'min is not to be intimidated. He says, are you trying to threaten me with, with your gods? Well, Allah has, Allah has guided me. If I have Allah on my side, if I am blessed with divine guidance, what do I have to fear? So Ibrahim السلام, wonders how his people think that their vain disputations could have an effect upon him given that his guidance is from God and how, how they could even hope to frighten him by invoking the idols and the partners they ascribed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who are not able to help or benefit others let, themselves let alone others. And then if you look at the ayah, his qualification, he says, Now his qualification of, you know, I, I am not afraid of your idols and no harm will come to me unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. Now, his qualification here indicates that he fears only what comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah is ultimately in control of all things. And if he were to fear their deities or their idols, it would only be because it would only be as a result of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will to test him in a certain way. So if Ibrahim alayhi salam did not make that qualification and he were to have experienced suffering if he were to have been harmed the mushrikeen would have attributed his suffering to his rejection of the idol so here he says except if allah wills that i that some harm may come to me to kind of dispel that potential argument that they could put forward that the harm that he may be experiencing is a result of the rejection of the idols and then at the end of the ayah he says, وَسِعَ رَبِّي كُلَّ شَيْءٍ عِلْمًا أَفَلَا تَتَذَكَّرُونَ My Lord encompasses all things in knowledge. Then will you not remember? Everything, brothers and sisters, occurs according to Allah's knowledge and His wisdom. And this is a recurring theme that we find in the Holy Quran. There are many ayat in the Quran that end with references to Allah's attributes of knowledge and wisdom. If you look at, for example, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 255, which is Ayatul Kursi, 
In the middle of Ayatul Kursi, we read, يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ Allah knows what is in front of you. Meaning Allah knows what will happen to you in the future, according to some interpretations. وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is behind you. So He knows your future and He knows your past. وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنْ عِلْمِهِ إِلَّا بِمَا شَاءٍ and no one can access Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge because Allah has ihata of all things. He has knowledge of all aspects of every single entity. In the next ayah, ayah number 81, مَا لَمْ يُنَزِّلْ بِهِ عَلَيْكُمْ سُلْطَانًا فَأَيُّ الْفَرِيقَيْنُ أَحَقُّ بِالْأَمْنِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ Again, Ibrahim a.s. continues. Here, Ibrahim is still speaking. He says, and how should I fear what you associate while you do not fear that you have associated with God that for which he has sent down to you any authority. So which of the two parties has more right to security if you, if you, have, if you know? Ibrahim السلام, continues his argument with his people expressing amazement that they could expect him to fear helpless idols Although they had no fear of associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Ibrahim alayhi salam is telling them that we both agree that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Just like the ancient Arabs during the time of Rasulullah, they both acknowledge that Allah is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Ibrahim is saying to them that why, sh why should I be afraid? The onus is on you to prove that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has partners. We've established that Allah is the creator of the heavens and the earth. We are in agreement that Allah is the one who originated the heavens and the earth. The disagreement where we diverge is, is with respect to the the partners that you're ascribing. So that's where the doubt is. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he says, why should I be afraid? The onus is on you to prove that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has partners. Because everything in the universe points to the existence of a single creator. Therefore, the burden of proof is on you. You are the ones who should be afraid. Because you're ascribing partners to him without substantiating your claim. Your only argument is what? Oh, this is what our forefathers taught us. This is not a dalil. This is not proof. This is not considered acceptable evidence. And then in ayah number 82, and then at the end of the ayah, he, he poses this question. Which of the two parties has more right to security? Who is playing it safe, if I want to use that language? Who is playing it safe? You, the ones who are adding partners to Allah, or me, the one who has ascribed no partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because I have no evidence to suggest that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has helpers or associates or partners. And then in ayah number 82, the answer is given. A question was asked, who has, who is going to be protected from divine punishment? Who is going to be secured and safe from divine punishment? Ayah number 82 answers. الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَلَمْ يَلْبِسُوا إِيمَانَهُمْ بِظُلْمِ أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمُ الْأَمْنِ وَهُمْ مُهْتَدُونَ See, in the previous ayah, Ibrahim asked, Which one of the two parties 
this this strict monotheist or the polytheist who is who has a greater right to security from divine punishment the answer is here the, the ones who believe they who believe and do not mix their belief with injustice these will have security and they are rightly guided so iman that is not mixed with dhulm. Now when this ayah was revealed, the companions of the Prophet, they panicked. They came to Rasulullah because technically any sin is a form of dhulm. You know, you have, there's dhulm against others, there's injustice against others, and there's injustice against your own soul. Both of them are a type of dhulm. So this I is saying those who have the ones who are protected from divine punishment are the ones who have faith that is not mixed with dhulm. If sinning is a type of dhulm, the conclusion is what? The one who sins is not protected from divine punishment. And because none of us are infallible, many of the companions they rushed to Rasulullah and they said to the Prophet. Ya Rasulullah, wa ayyuna lam yadhlim nafsa? Ya Rasulullah, which one of us has not done dhulm against himself? Meaning, which one of us has not sinned? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he answers, he says, innahu laysa alladhi ta'noon. He tells them that the ayah doesn't mean what you think it means. The ayah doesn't mean that those who believe and who have never committed any type of dhulm, they are the ones who will be safe from divine punishment. If this is the case, then only ma'sumin will be protected from punishment. Rasulullah says, the dhulm that is mentioned in this ayah is shirk, the theoretical shirk, actually ascribing partners to Allah. Rasulullah says, Alam tasma'u ila ma qal al abdu salih. So when the companions say, Ya Rasulullah, which one of us doesn't do dhulm against his own self by committing sin? Rasulullah says, The ayah doesn't mean what you think it means. Have you not heard what that righteous servant said to his son, meaning Luqman? What did Luqman say to his son? The first piece of advice that Luqman gives to his son is what? Ya Bunay, la tushrik billah, inna shirka la dhulmun azim. This ayah is speaking about the greatest dhulm, which is to associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ones who don't associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who are muwahideen, the monotheists, they are protected from punishment. They have this security. Now, it's interesting that Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq salawatullahi alayhi when he was asked about this verse, he mentions something other than a shirk al the the greater shirk the imam alayhi salam when he was asked about what is the meaning of having faith and not mixing faith with wrongdoing with dhulm with injustice the imam alayhi salam he says when he was asked about this ayah alladhina amanu wa lam yalbisu imanahum bi dhulm Imam al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi says, بِمَا جَاءَ بِهِ مُحَمَّدٌ مِنَ الْوِلَايَةِ وَلَمْ يَخْلِطُوهَا بِوِلَايَةِ فُلَانٍ وَفُلَانٍ It means, Imam al-Sadiq says, it means that they respect the wilaya that was with the Prophet and transferred to Amir al-Mu'mineen. And they don't mix this wilaya with the wilaya of others. The wilaya of certain companions who seized 
power after the Holy Prophet. Meaning you have faith and you don't mix this wilaya, this divine guardianship with others. You don't mix it. You don't say that I, ex I accept the wilaya of Rasulullah and then Abu Bakr. Now this is an example of you're mixing an, an authorized wilaya with an unauthorized wilaya. So the Imam السلام, with this ayah, he speaks about it in the context of the usurpation of the wilaya of Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullahi. If we go to ayah number 84, وَتِلْكَ and that was our conclusive argument which we gave Ibrahim against his people. We raise by degrees whom we will. Indeed, your Lord is wise and knowing. Now, it's interesting here that although it was Ibrahim السلام, who formulated the arguments and articulated the uh, the arguments against the polytheist Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes credit for the argument so even though the argument was articulated by Ibrahim Allah says this was our argument Tilka hujjatuna ataynaha Ibrahim that was our conclusive argument which we gave Ibrahim against his people. Now why does Allah do this? Because Allah wants to remind us that although it was Ibrahim who formulated the syllogism and articulated the argument, Allah reminds us that I am the one who bestowed intellect upon Ibrahim. I am the one who gave eloquence to him. So in reality, the argument is mine. Ibrahim has no power without the blessings that I have bestowed upon him. Now our argument, when Allah says, تِلْكَ حُجَّتُنَا آتَيْنَاهَا إِبْرَاهِيمُ عَلَىٰ قَوْمِ Our argument refers to either the argument about who should fear God's punishment and who should feel secure from it, as put forward in the verses that we mentioned, or this could be a reference to the, the argument that Ibrahim السلام, had regarding the celestial bodies that we covered in our last session in verses 76 to 78. Or it could be a combination of the, the two of them. نَرْفَعُ دَرَجَاتٍ مَنْ نَشَاءٍ We raise by degrees whom we will. This expression is found in many verses in the Quran. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about raising degrees when it comes to issues of provision and power that are apportioned to people in this life. If you go to, for, for example, Surah Zukhruf, Surah 43, ayah number 32. Allah says, Ahum yaqsimuna rahmata rabbi. Are they the ones who distribute the mercy of your Lord? Nahnu qasamna baynahum ma'ishatahum fil hayat dunya Allah says, we are the ones who distribute the livelihood among the people. وَرَفَعْنَا بَعْضَهُمْ فَوْقَ بَعْضٍ دَرَجَاتٍ And we have raised others above others. Meaning Allah says, I have given more rizq to some than others. So here, raising, the raising of degrees in this ayah, for example, is a reference to livelihood and sustenance and worldly provisions. Sometimes the raising of darajat, rafa'ud darajat, the raising of degrees, 
is used in the context of reward for virtuous actions. If you go to Surah Al-Ahqaf, Surah 46, verse 19, Allah says, وَلِكُلِّنْ دَرَجَاتٌ مِمَّا عَمِلُوا All of the believers will have degrees based on their actions. So the degrees in the hereafter are based on amal. وَلِيُوَفِّيَهُمْ أَعْمَالَهُمْ وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ The raising of degrees is also used in some verses in reference to knowledge and wisdom. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes raises people in knowledge and wisdom. If you go to Surah Al-Mujadala, Surah number 58, ayah number 11. يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ Allah raises the degrees of the believers, of those who have faith. وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتِ And those who have been given knowledge, those who possess knowledge, they are raised many degrees. So it seems that after having faith, the thing that allows you to ascend further is ilm. Faith alone can only take you so far. يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ Allah raises those who have faith. But those who have knowledge are raised many degrees. And then another usage of the word of, of the raising of degrees is used in reference to degrees of prophethood, degrees of the ranks of prophets. Because not all prophets are of equal spiritual rank in the eyes of Allah. If you go to Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah number 2, verse 253, Allah says, تِلْكَ الرُّسُلُ فَضَّلْنَا بَعْضَهُمْ عَلَىٰ بَعْضٍ Allah says, those are the messengers. We have favored some over others. مِنْهُمْ مَنْ كَلَّمَ Allah. Allah here mentions some of the distinctions that were given to some prophets and others were deprived of this. Some prophets, Allah spoke to them directly without the medium of an angel like Musa not, not every prophet had this privilege where Allah speaks to them without any medium of an angel. And Allah raised some prophets many degrees, many ranks above others. Now, in the, in the ayah that we're looking at, ayah number 84 from Surah Al-An'am, in this context, the implication, Allah says, نَرْفَعُ دَرَجَاتٍ مَنْ نَشَاء In this context, the implication is that Allah raised Ibrahim in degrees by virtue of the argument that he gave him against his people. Now this is significant. You see brothers and sisters, there are some people who are guided and they've achieved nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have a certain rank with Him by virtue of, of their own actions and their own beliefs and their own good deeds. But Ibrahim alayhi salam is elevated, why? Because he's using his knowledge to try to guide other people. He's using argumentation to illuminate the hearts of others, to enlighten others. Allah says, because of that, because this is a man who's using rational argumentation to invite people, he's not satisfied with just being the only one who is pious and righteous in a society. He's actively trying to bring others on a sirat al-mustaqeem. Because of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevated him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who try to bring others close to him.
in the next ayah, ayah number 84, I believe. وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ إِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبِ Is this number 84? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah, number 84. Ayah number 84. So the previous one was 83. وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ إِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبِ كُلًّا هَدَيْنَا وَنُوحًا هَدَيْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِهِ دَاوُودَ وَسُلَيْمَانَ وَأَيُّوبَ وَيُوسُفَ وَمُوسَى وَهَارُونَ وَكَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ When I was reading this verse today, brothers and sisters, I felt like I finally began to appreciate this ayah. Now why do I say that? So let me read the translation for you. And we gave to Ibrahim, we gifted Ibrahim, Isaac, and Jacob. And all of them we guided. And Noah we guided before. And among his descendants, and among the descendants of Ibrahim, David, Solomon, Job, Joseph, Moses, and Aaron. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse he speaks about the great blessing that he has bestowed upon Ibrahim you know Ibrahim had a very difficult childhood as we mentioned in our last session he lived in total isolation he lived alone he, he was virtually abandoned during his childhood when he comes back to his community, he's arguing and he's debating. The entire community is against him. Many of you know that they decided to even catapult him inside of the fire. He had a very tumultuous upbringing. But because of his steadfastness, because of his unshakable faith, because of the purity of his heart, Allah gave him the best thing that Allah can give a human being. And that is what? Righteous children. Now it's, it's difficult enough to be righteous in a society full of mushrikeen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't only give him children. Because as you know, brothers and sisters, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he was not given children until very late in his life. According to a hadith, he was in his 90s. And his wife, Sarah, was barren. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him Ishaq, and then Yaqub is his grandson. By the way, brothers and sisters, there are 26 prophets that are mentioned by name in the Qur'an. 16 out of the 26 are the sons of Ibrahim. 16 of the 26 Anbiya prophets that are mentioned in the Quran are the children and the grandchildren and the great grandchildren of Ibrahim. Look at how Allah rewarded Ibrahim. He kept his legacy alive. So, وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ إِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبِ Allah says, we gifted Ibrahim with Ishaq and Ya'qub. Now, what, the question is, why is Ismail not mentioned? Ismail will be mentioned in the upcoming verses. But I would argue that the birth of Ishaq is more miraculous than the birth of Ismail. Why? Because... Ibrahim is 90 years old. It's very rare for anyone to have children at that age. His wife Sarah was barren. She wasn't able to have children. Hajar was not barren. Ibrahim was given Ismail through Hajar, but Hajar was not barren. So giving when Allah gives Ishaq to Ibrahim and Sarah, that's a bit more miraculous. 
Because here you have an elderly man and you and you have a barren woman. But with Isha, with uh, Ismail, it was only Ibrahim that was an old man. Hajar was not barren. So Ishaq and Yaqub are given to Ibrahim. And the reason why they are unique is not just because they're the sons of Ibrahim. Kullan hadayna, Allah says, I guided them. They're guided. They're enlightened sons. They're pious sons. That's why they're valuable. Now, why is Nabi Nuh mentioned? Nuh, Allah says, and Nuh we guided before. It's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want us to think. He doesn't want the Arabs in Mecca during the time of Rasulullah to think that it was Ibrahim who introduced Tawheed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here says that Tawheed was propagated by Nuh. Tawheed is not new. وَإِنَّ مِنْ شِيَعَتِهِ لَإِبْرَاهِيمِ In Surah Safat, Allah, Allah calls Ibrahim one of the Shia of Nuh. Nuh was a monotheist, he was a pure monotheist, and so was Ibrahim. And then the descendants of Ibrahim are mentioned. Dawood, Sulaiman, Ayyub, Yusuf, Musa, Isa. These are all from the blessed tree of Ibrahim. So if you look at Ibrahim, السلام, he comes from a very honorable family tree. His great-grandfather is Nuh. And then you have all of these Anbiya that come from his two sons, from uh, Ismail and from Ishaq. وَكَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Now these individuals, Dawood, Sulaiman, all of these prophets, they weren't chosen arbitrarily. This is not a monarchy where just because you're the son of Ibrahim, you're a prophet. Allah says, no. وَكَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ These personalities are revered because they're muhsineen, because they're good doers. Their faith manifested itself through their conduct, through their, man through their mannerism. Then we go to the next ayah, ayah number 85. And Zechariah, and John, and Jesus, and Elias, and all were of the righteous. Now Zechariah he's mentioned in many verses in the Quran. He's the uncle of Maryam, the father of Yahya alayhi salam, a very holy personality in the Islamic tradition. Yahya and Isa, John the Baptist and Jesus alayhi salam are very familiar to you. Now Ilyas, there's a, there a discussion among the ulama regarding the identity of Ilyas. We don't have very much information about him. But some scholars have said that he is the nephew or he's one of the descendants of Harun, the brother of Musa. Then in the next ayah, ayah number 86, wa Ismail. Here Ismail is mentioned. And Ishmael and Eliza, and Jonah, and Lot, and all of them were preferred over the worlds. And I'll read the final ayah, and inshallah we'll conclude our discussion. وَمِنْ آبَائِهِمْ وَذُرِّيَّاتِهِمْ وَإِخْوَانِهِمْ وَاجْتَبَيْنَاهُمْ وَهَدَيْنَاهُمْ إِلَىٰ صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ And some among their fathers, and their descendants, and their brothers, and we chose them, and we guided them to a straight path. 
So here Allah is telling us that not all of the prophets that were sent are mentioned. Some of these prophets had fathers, brothers, and descendants who are also prophets and messengers, but Allah says, I didn't specifically mention them in the Holy Quran. Now there's an important point of reflection here. It is narrated that during the time of Imam Al-Kazim our seventh holy Imam, the Imam السلام, was in Medina and he was visiting the grave of Rasulullah and at that time Harun al-Rashid was visiting Medina and Harun al-Rashid sees Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kazim addressing Rasulullah, addressing him as my grandfather Rasulullah. Harun al-Rashid, he recites his ziyara and he addresses the Holy Prophet as his cousin, Yabn al-Am. Because Harun al-Rashid is from Bani Abbas, and Abbas was the uncle of the Prophet, and therefore his children would be the cousins of Rasulullah. When Imam al-Kazim hears Harun al-Rashid boasting and addressing the Prophet as his cousin, Imam al-Kazim addresses the Holy Prophet as his own father, as his grandfather. Harun al-Rashid becomes angry and he says that you are the son of Ali, you're not the son of Muhammad because the progeny goes through the line of the father, not the line of the mother. You are the sons of Ali, Rasulullah didn't leave any sons for you to be called the sons of Rasulullah because the, the Imams, they would be called Yabna Rasulullah as we recite in the ziyarat. Here, Imam al-Kazim says, no, we are the sons of Rasulullah. Harun al-Rashid says, what's your dalil? What's your evidence? Imam al-Kazim he says, will you give me, will you grant me security if I give you the answer? Harun says, yes. What is your proof? That you are the grandson of the Holy Prophet, that you are from his line. Imam al Kazim he mentions this ayah, ayah number 84 from Surah Al An'am. Because Allah is speaking about the progeny of Ibrahim, yes? Harun al Rashid says that you're that you don't you're not connected to the Prophet. Because your only link to the Prophet is Fatima. You are the sons of Ali. Imam al kazim he recites this ayah, he says, وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِهِ دَاوُودِ وَسُلَيْمَانِ وَأَيُّوبِ وَيُوسُفِ وَمُوسَى وَهَارُونِ وَكَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الْمُحْسِرِينَ And then he recites the next ayah, the next ayah where Isa is mentioned, وَزَكَرِيَّا وَيَحْيَا وَعِيسَى وَإِلْيَاسَ كُلٌّ مِّنَ الصَّالِحِينَ So Imam Al-Kazim السلام, he turns to Harun and he says, مَنْ أَبُوْ عِيسَى يَا هارون. Who is the father of Isa? Allah in the Qur'an considers Isa the son of Ibrahim. Who is the father of, of Isa? He's connected to Ibrahim through Maryam. And Imam al kazim says, we are connected to Rasulullah through Fatim. So he gives him a Quranic proof. And this is why Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, salawatullahi alayhi, he says, إِنَّمَا أُلْحِقَ بِذَرَارِ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ مِنْ طَرِيقِ Maryam That Isa alayhi salam was connected to Ibrahim through Maryam because he had no father. And we are the sons of Rasulullah. We are the progeny of Rasulullah. وَكَذَلِكَ أُلْحِقْنَا بِذَرَارِ النَّبِي 
من قبل فاطمة عليه السلام. Now one final point is that the Mufassirin have asked why is it that these prophets are grouped in three different groups. So if you look at the ayah, the first verse that speaks about the progeny of Ibrahim, you have Dawood, Sulaiman, Ayyub, Yusuf, Musa, and Harun. Six prophets are mentioned from the progeny of, of Ibrahim a.s. And if you count the beginning of the ayah, Ishaq and Ya'qub, that's eight. And then in the second group, you have Zakariya, Yahya, and Isa. And then in the last group, you have Ismail, Eliyasa, Yunus, and Lut. So why are all of these prophets paired together? Some of the Mufassirin of the Quran have said, the prophets that are mentioned in the first group, Allah ends the ayah by saying, وَكَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ He calls them muhsinin. What do those prophets have in common? In addition to being prophets, at one time or another in their lives, they had political power or judicial power. So they have this in common. And Allah praises them for being muhsineen. They were good doers. They didn't oppress people when they were given power. Because the most important thing for someone who is in power is to be muhsin, to do ihsan, to do good to others, not to abuse their power, not to allow their power to corrupt them. So this is the first group. The second group was Zakaria, Yahya, and Isa, and, and Ilyas. Allah calls them Salihin. Kullun min al -salihin. Now what does Zakaria, Yahya, Isa, and Ilyas have in common? Zuhud. Zuhud. You see, brothers and sisters, Bani Israel at that time period, they were indulging too much in dunya. So Allah sends them prophets that are exemplars in asceticism. They're very detached from dunya. And the foundation of righteousness is detachment from dunya. Do you want to be among as salihin You cannot be attached to dunya. So this is what Zakaria. Yahya, Isa, and Ilyas have in common. Zuhud. This asceticism that they have. And then the final group is Ismail, Ilyasa, Yunus, and Lut. These four prophets, what do they have in common? Hijrah. They traveled very much. They traveled to many different communities to invite people towards God. Ismail had traveled a lot. Eliasa, Yunus, Yunus left his community. Lut had to leave his community. So these are prophets who experienced a lot of hardship. They had to travel from region to region to invite people towards the straight path. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us and guide us and to illuminate our hearts with, with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين. اللهم صل على محمد. We have a few minutes for questions and answers. Sheikh, one question. Sure. Why do we consider that Sayyids are only from paternal descent if we have this this different thing going on? Or just for all Muslims. This is this is the only exception. This is the only exception because we have a hadith that specifically talk about the idea. You talk about like the issue of of khums and zakat. Uh, yeah, yeah. Or just for any any purpose, really. Just why is it considered that like? Because it would generally you say that sayyids are only from a paternal descent, and so why why is that the case? I guess khums and zakat can also be an implication of. The effects of this policy. 
So why is see if so? Your question is why is it that we only consider Sada from the the uh, the lineage of the uh, of the father? Yeah, basically. From what I've read and the, the the commentaries of the of uh, of uh, of the Quran and these uh, you know these uh, hadith, this is the exception. It's just considered an exception. And because it's related, it's related to the, the issue of zakat and qums, those who, who uh, whose, whose father's ancestral line goes back to Hashim, they're considered uh, they're considered sad. But this is so strange, but this is just a verbal thing, right? Uh, I mean, if a, if you see a take a person, any person, uh, the genetic link. With the, is with the mom and the maternal side and the paternal side. To say that you're a descendant from this side, basically, this is a verbal thing. I mean, genetically. Absolutely. So if, if you look at the Quran, the Quran doesn't make any distinction when it comes to inheritance, when it comes to these issues, Sayyid or non Sayyid. So this is just, you know, an extra, an extra respect that is afforded to, uh, to those whose, uh, whose father's line goes back to the, uh, to the Holy Prophet. But when it comes to in all other areas, they're considered equal. Okay. There's a question here, Sheikh. You mentioned that knowledge after faith can elevate the human being to higher degrees. Can you please explain what type of knowledge is meant here? Does that mean logical thinking about God and the world in general, or is it different knowledge? Uh, meant? Any knowledge that that. Uh, that brings you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that facilitates divine proximity, is knowledge that uh, that elevates you. Religious knowledge, you know, the type of knowledge that, that sharpens your critical thinking skills, especially if it's used to, uh, you know, to study religious texts, to, to ponder and reflect over Allah's creation. All of this type of knowledge is considered knowledge that... Uh, that uh, has the potential to elevate from the verse that says that like those who don't associate partners with Allah are protected from punishment no. uh, what about different levels of monotheism is this talking only about like people who are very explicitly more like polytheists or is it like when you have small amounts of kufr in your heart does that also apply to this like which, you, which I are you looking at this was I uh, I think uh, let me just check real quick I at 82. I at 82. So ba based on the ahadith, that th this is a reference to a shirk al akbar, those who actually ascribe partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, so a shirk al khafi, for example, you know, as long as it's not the theoretical shirk, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't seem to, uh, apply to this verse because the holy prophet specifically you know he kind of calms the nerves of his companions who were afraid that this could be you know uh the hidden polytheism but he says no this is you know what this is essentially what luqman told his son that don't ascribe partners to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala don't harbor this belief that allah has helpers or aids or partners because this is what is being referenced in the in the verse yeah. So, see, this seems to be so because so other other forms of shirk are forgivable, but this this you know this type of shirk is at least on the day of judgment. If if someone doesn't do toba here, and they're not they're not justified in holding that belief, then then they're not going to be uh, protected from from punishment. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So so going back to the shirk. It's like um, shirk is also is nijasat, right? So the only people who uh, are not najis, besides most other Christians, are the Jews. And the question is why not the Sikh people? Because they also just believe in one God. So the, the issue, the issue of, and, and again, you know, the, this issue of tahara and najasa of uh, of kuffar, it seems like there's a debate among. Uh, Contemporary jurists. There are a few, a, a couple that I know that that have given uh, religious edicts where they where they they believe that all human beings are uh, are uh, 
are bahir and this najasa is this it's a spiritual impurity it's not a physical one but but the, the majority of scholars do believe that anyone other than ahlul kitab uh, are uh, ritually are, are basically impure they're they're not considered uh, pure so ahlul kitab have to have a divine book so believing that there's only one god doesn't qualify you to be among ahlul kitab because the, you have to have a kitab the jews they they profess a belief in one god and they're they're recipients of of revelation they have a Torah. yeah granted it's been distorted there and there are adulterations but there was a book that was revealed to them the christians are the same so it seems that there there needs to be a belief in one god and there has to be a book that they're following that at least was revealed to them the, the zoroastrians according to some of the fuqaha some fuqaha believe zoroastrians are also ahl al-kitab because zoroaster was a prophet and he had a book but the, the book is no longer available but Sikhs, they are not they're not at least from our perspective they're not considered uh they don't have a a book that we recognize as as revelation like the Torah or the Injil. Could you talk a little bit about what is the difference between the meaning of Fatara and Falak? Fatara and Falak? In the Arabic language they're they're considered uh synonyms. I, I would have to actually look up in a in a very I'd have to probably check Lisan al Arab, a more advanced encyclopedia, to kind of see if there's a, a subtle difference. But off the top of my head, falaqa and fatara, from from what I remember, and again, I, don't quote me on this. Falaq, falaqa might refer to the splitting of of things that are small, whereas fatara may refer to the splitting of things that are larger if i remember correctly if my memory is not failing so they, they, both, they both refer to the act of breaking something or splitting it but i think the difference may be to respect uh, with respect to the the size of the object that's being split possibly but i would have to check so for example if i remember like falaq al habba Falaq al habba the one who split the seed. Allah didn't, he didn't say fatar al habba So this this could be kind of uh, you know uh, used as an indication that falaqa is is used generally for objects that are smaller in size, whereas fatara, as we read here in the ayah, fatara samawati wal Thank you very much. Jazakumullah, inshallah. I pray that you guys found this beneficial. Please keep me in your dua, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you. Allah bless you.